Christmas 2006 was as much a time for anxiety as celebration for former Victorian Premier Steve Brax. The ALP had just won a third term in office, but behind the scenes, Brax's inner sanctum was facing a nightmare scenario. Melbourne, Victoria's capital, running out of water. Ravaged by drought, the state stopped looking to the skies, sidestepped the tricky debate around recycling and turned to the sea for a solution. A $3 billion plan to desalinate billions of litres of water from Bass Strait was the centrepiece of the 2007 plan to keep Melbourne from running dry. But as Labor sought to overcome nature by drought-proofing Melbourne and itself, the heavens and global money conspired otherwise. Four and a half years later, the one Thaggy diesel plant has failed to meet its completion deadline of December 2011 and is now more than a year behind the original schedule set by Steve Brax. Melbourne's dams are rising as fast as the household water bills that must pay for a project that, advisors to the value government say, the state may never need. Who are the winners and losers from Victoria's biggest ever civic project? And is Victoria building the world's most elaborate white elephant? If this drought continued, let's say it was 15, 17, 18 years, the likelihood is that Melbourne would have run out of water. In the foreseeable future, we effectively don't need the desal plant. Unfortunately, there's a sovereign risk if we break that contract and the expense of breaking it is, is probably more expensive than actually keeping the project going. Over seven years, the Brax government battled drought through water conservation and small initiatives to boost water supply. It was part of a policy that viewed drought as part of a long-term cyclical weather pattern. But attitudes changed in late 2006 and early 2007 when scientists began to warn that climate change may have driven dramatic downward step changes in rainfall. Urgent action was needed and, for all its financial and environmental costs, diesel was the quickest and least rainfall dependent option on offer. Labor would build one of the largest reverse osmosis desal plants in the world, able to produce 150 billion litres of water a year, one third of Melbourne's yearly consumption. Within weeks of their announcement in mid-2007, Brax and his Deputy and Water Minister John Thwaites would retire, leaving can-do Treasurer-turned-Premier John Brumby and the feisty Tim Holding to usher in a new hard-headed approach to water management. The government's embrace of the energy-guzzling desal option and its impatience with protest left local environmentalists unimpressed. We certainly don't need it. And if they had taken proper steps rather than allowing the, the desal plant people to get in their ear, then we wouldn't, we'd be, have a sustainable solution now which we wouldn't be paying for for the next 30 years. Nonetheless, a multi-billion dollar project employing thousands of workers was an undoubted boost to the local economy. Well, I think it's had a, it's had a resounding impact, particularly in Wanthaggy and the centres such as Imolok, Wanthaggy and San Remo. Um, I suppose the food sector, you know, has had a big impact on the food sector. It has had an impact here with our food trade. Just how much cash diesel workers had to splash would become a political issue as part of the wider questioning of the extravagance of the project. Calculations by the age indicate that wages and conditions at the Victorian site are as much as 40% above those on desal projects in other states. And the rates of pay were good, but they were good because you had four 12-hour days and so much of your, your daily rate in an accelerated time frame was penalty hours in excess of eight in a day. And of course, your normal week on some weeks will include a Saturday and a Sunday. At Wanthaggy, diesel builders Tess Degremont appear to have chosen the strategy of buying industrial peace through generous pay and giving wide coverage to the militant building union, the CFMEU. It's a plan that seemed to work until an industrial spying operation involving strike breaker Bruce Townsend was revealed. Yeah, we'd never seen anything like it as unions. It was really bizarre. Um, to see a project that had, had not one day lost on the job, had no industrial relations issues, yet they're going to union busters and engaging in spying activities on the job. I think then the T's lost a lot of the confidence uh, of the workforce. Bruce Towns, it wasn't a great outcome for us. Um, it was a couple of individuals who were working here. It was, it was difficult for our staff, it was difficult for the company, and it was certainly difficult for the unions. When the government announced the desal scheme, it was upfront about the cost to Melbourne water users. Well, I think there is a, a, 
a general realisation that we've really been in a fool's paradise, uh, paradise on the cost of water. Um, you know, the, the cost had to go up to pay for uh, modern water supplies and servicing those modern water supplies. But in 2007, it was easy to be transparent about water costs. Political consensus was gathering around the idea of pricing both water and carbon, and even arch-conservative Prime Minister John Howard had accepted that carbon pricing was a vote winner. I remember with trepidation one day after we did a lot of the prep work saying water prices are going to double and I must admit the Victorian public accepted it largely and no one likes increases in prices but largely I think on the basis that there was a general realisation that we couldn't do what we've done in the past. At the very time that stories about the bold water plan hit the front pages the business pages had start talking about a subprime mortgage saga in the US. Private finance was required to bankroll the diesel project. As one senior Victorian bureaucrat from the time has put it to the age, in financial terms the diesel couldn't have come at a worse time. The global financial crisis put the brakes on lending, and with reduced supply the cost of cash rose, adding what senior PPP experts estimate to be billions to the overall nominal cost of the diesel scheme. I'd be of the view that this particular project, because the cost of money was clearly more expensive with the GFC, that it must have been getting close to that you know, position where you looked at it very carefully to make sure you got value. It must have been close to a line ball type decision. So building workers are not alone in doing well out of the One Thaggy project. The bigger long-term winners are likely to be the financiers, including Australia's four major banks, who drove a hard bargain at a time when money was scarce and the financial advisors and lawyers who made windfalls from the creation of the complex desale contract. At that point, government put the cost of the project, including the water, at $5.7 billion in 2009 dollars. But a year later it emerged that water users would pay $650 million a year, water or not, and that the nominal cost of the project would be $24 billion over 28 years. By then, desale was on the nose, and money was not the only reason. With cruel irony, it poured with rain in late July 2009 when the Aquashore Group was awarded the desalt project. The irony deepened when builders T. Stegremont blamed bad weather and even worse industrial relations for failing to meet the December 2011 completion deadline. The weather has had a significant impact. We've gone through from having the driest three years ever in Victoria and 14 years of drought to the wettest winter and the wettest summer in Victoria on record. It is, uh, that certainly has an impact and there's been elements of uh, productivity and industrial relations issues which have had some effect on us. The desal builders now hope the project will produce its first water in late 2012, almost a year later than scheduled. It also hopes the plant will be fully operational in February 2013, 14 months later than Steve Brax had promised. There's a lot of recent opportunities still out there. There's, there's weather conditions that may or may not be favourable to us, but yeah, we're very confident we'll be producing water May, June, and we'll progressively bring it on. As to a, an exact end date, you know, it will be, it, it will follow on in a sequence of events which would hopefully finish before the end of the year. After scoring political points for years over Labor's desal, the Bayview government now faces its own test on the project. Aquashore has lodged claims with the government for delays due to bad weather and workplace problems. The reality is what has been experienced on the site has gone way beyond the kind of provision that you could have made in, in, um, in a competitive process like that. And, and I, I don't think anybody ever bids um, on the basis of the most extreme scenario that you can possibly imagine. And of course in some ways we've, uh, they have experienced, at least in terms of weather, extremes that have gone beyond the record. But water consumers already facing rising bills are likely to take a dim view of any government move to bail out the corporate chiefs overseeing the desal plant. The Premier and I have always said that we would enforce the contract. We would be irresponsible on behalf of Melbourne Water customers if we said we would not uh, have a look at a proposal from Aquashore. So they have lodged a preliminary case for extension of time. Uh, it is without prejudice and is something that's currently being assessed. If you change the deal, which is what you'd be doing, and I suppose became generous and started to re-strike how you'd assess the risk transfer and start to pay for the risk that you've already paid for in the deal, you'd have you know, clearly a worse financial position than you would have expected. And as a taxpayer, I'd be expecting government to stand firm. So, was the desale a mistake? 
While the immediate water crisis has passed, the future and the real impact of climate change are unknown. Around the world, most countries these days will in fact use recycled water and you know, as a technical person that water is very good to drink, it's very he healthy, it's clean, there's nothing wrong with it and um, it would seem to be a more sustainable solution for our community to seriously look at using recycled water in my view. Just as um, Sir Rupert Hamer commissioned the Thompson Dam, an enormous dam, looked like it was going to be sufficient forever. And we find, of course, with low inflows, it's not sufficient forever. He was right in doing that. And I believe we'll be seen as right as well in making sure that we do it properly. This was really providing for um, increased population, in increased industry growth, and the prospect of a drought and climate change affecting what happened to our reservoirs in the future. I think history initially will judge them harshly when the, when the price of water in Melbourne starts to go up because the diesel costs will be passed through the Melbourne water customers. They're not going to thank Steve Brax at that time, particularly when you look at what's happened now, and, and no one can second guess the weather, but I, there, is, there is a lot of conjecture about whether we need it, as you've said, one of the biggest diesel plants in the world. Mm -hmm.